I think one of the magical things about travel is you're in this cocoon of possibility. Anything can happen. And anything can happen because you're open to it. You're in a different environment. You're in a different routine. You have different stimuli around you. So all of a sudden, you're very present moment aware. And that's something that we really lose in our day-to-day -day lives. And I think by being very present moment aware and perhaps having a little bit of a sense of adventure because you're on a trip, you could be open to things that you might not ordinarily be open to. You're listening to The Creative Imposter, episode 109. Welcome to The Creative Imposter. I'm Andrea Klender. During our creative pandemic pivot journey over the last few months, we've talked about business, copy, self-care, community, visibility, art, finances, meditation, music, and we haven't talked about travel. In fact, travel is one of the areas where I personally have a lot of anxiety right now. Ever since my first trip overseas to France at age 16, oh so long ago, with my high school French teacher, Madame Boyd, travel and specifically international travel has been a key part of my creative identity. I still have the travel journal from back when I wrote on the plane on the way home from Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. I don't know how, but I do know that travel is always going to be an important part of my life. Wise prediction from my 16-year-old self. And now, in a post-COVID world, oh hey, we're not even there yet. But once we do get to a post-COVID world, what does that even look like? Travel. The rest of 2020, I was planning two domestic trips to Dallas, Texas, and Scottsdale, Arizona to attend Podcast Movement and She Podcasts Live. Podcast conferences have become integral to my business as a podcast producer, consultant, and coach, and also integral to my life because they are where I connect in person with friends who I normally only see online or hear in my headphones when I listen to their podcasts. Now, one conference is officially canceled, and the other one, while not officially canceled, I imagine they might. And in either case, I decided to defer my ticket for that conference to 2021. Besides that, it's been a few years since I've been out of the country, and that is far too long for me. I always start to get a little restless when that happens. And now, having spent the vast majority of the last few months within my two-bedroom Chicago apartment, well, I'm longing for an adventure. The first time I spoke with Pat Wetzel, it was on the phone. I was sitting at a poolside restaurant eating mahi-mahi tacos on lunch break at PodFest in Orlando, Florida. Yep, another podcast conference. It was a little over a year ago, and this was my last trip before going in for a mastectomy and reconstruction surgery for stage zero ductal carcinoma in situ. Ugh. My body, my health, my life was all changing, and I was in a whirlwind. Pat was introduced to me because she was thinking of starting a podcast as part of a larger initiative called Cancer Road Trip. Whoa, talk about timing. What is Cancer Road Trip? Well, we talk about it during the interview that you're about to hear, but for some reason, I don't know, maybe it was exhaustion or distraction over the pandemic, which was brand new at the point that Pat and I connected at the end of March. We didn't exactly get into the why of the project until after I had officially ended the interview and we were just chatting to wrap up. And then in that moment, Pat perfectly described the heart of the Cancer Road Trip project the same way that she did to me on the phone in early 2019. Fortunately, because I am a good podcaster, my backup recording was still going, and so here is that stolen moment of conversation that I almost missed. A cancer road trip or something like this is so needed yeah. that this isn't something I can give up on. There are a lot of different ways this could evolve, but the basic premise that there is 
such a need and nothing to fulfill the need of post-treatment care. Yeah. Here and there, there are a few retreats, mostly for breast cancer survivors, and they're wonderful. First Descent takes kids, kids, young people on trips that challenge them physically. Mm. A great idea, a great idea. But I think that for the majority of us, there is very, very little. And I, I just know from talking to people all the time, there's so much pain and so much difficulty in trying to figure out, how do I integrate this experience? What did it mean? Does it mean anything? I'm not the same. My body's not the same. My head's not the same. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to remake your whole life. And nobody prepares you for this. Mm -hmm. And I think by hearing people's stories, one, people realize they're not alone, but they can get ideas that they can integrate into their own lives. And I think that really matters because ultimately it's up to you to craft your own life. Pat, that was so eloquent. And I had stopped recording on Squadcast, but I have a an external recorder that's also recording a backup right now. So I did record that little piece of what you just said about the <laughs> mission <are> behind. <laughs> I get on my soapbox pretty easily about it. But <laughs> I, I just, I put out on Twitter once an inquiry about what was the hardest thing you faced. And I listed a number of things. And the response I got back was overwhelming. I mean, it just brought you to tears when you saw what people were dealing with and that there's just nothing nothing to help. And I don't think our medical system is the right system to step in here. They do what they do pretty well. They should stay where they are. But I think a more community, uh, collective and community effort in terms of the human and emotional healing that's needed and the recognition that all these stories have an underlying theme and some meaning, that's where I, I think we can play and really make a difference. I like that, that connection to the storytelling. And I mean, obviously, you know, that's right up my alley. So. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Cancer Road Trip in a nutshell. You can hear Pat's sense of purpose and her vision. And that's what I have observed that she is so good at. Selling you on the vision and bringing you along for the ride. But how to launch a travel retreat for immunocompromised community during a global pandemic? Well, obviously, plans change and you need to be flexible. Pat, thank you so much for joining me on The Creative Imposter. Where are you tuning in from right now? I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Ah, uh, yes. I can see the beamed architecture <laughs> behind you, the bright sunlight. Tell us a little bit about what you have been working on lately, what some of your big projects are, and kind of what business as usual has been for you. Well, I've been putting most of my time into Cancer Road Trip. We give seven people who have been impacted by cancer an amazing bucket list trip somewhere in the world. And we captured all on film for both education and for inspiration. Now, this has obviously been put on hold with the coronavirus. We had planned to have our first retreat this fall in Santa Fe, and now we're looking at pushing it out most likely to the spring of 2021. Where did the idea for Cancer Road Trip come from? Oh, long story. I'll try to make it short. <laughs> <laughs> in 2009, I was diagnosed with supposedly incurable cancer. I spent the next five years going through treatments and finally got an a, a enduring remission. In doing this, I'd put together a website called anticancerclub.com. And Anti Cancer Club is always meant as a place for information, for patient voices, to just share about the cancer experience. It was never meant or designed to monetize. I had been designing, parallel with this, a technology platform that models and rewards human compassion, particularly through long term illness. So I went down to Silicon Valley to raise money, got interest, was told I needed to present a beta platform, hired a company to do a beta platform for me, signed the contracts and everything else. And then I waited and I waited and I emailed and I phoned and I sent registered letters, nothing. Finally, I got my lawyers on it and they came back to me and they said, well, looks like they've stolen all your intellectual property. It'll cost you in increments of half a million dollars and take at least three years of your life. And oh, by the way, we have half a dozen of these on our desk and the chances of winning are you know, not necessarily great. So I have a ton of money in this. I put this together through cancer. I have employees. I had to lay people off. One person had to file for bankruptcy. I was so stressed going through this that my hair was falling out from, not from chemo, but just from stress. I was vomiting blood. I went to see my oncologist and of course he was concerned. 
and recommended half a different tests and scans and different types of cancer could be and a recurrence and a million other devastating scenarios. So I got home and I just looked around and I thought, okay, I've been through this before. I've been through having the cancer come back. I've been through remission. And if this is anything like what I've been through before, I probably have somewhere between 12 and 24 months of quality life. What do I want to do? So put my house up for sale and I put everything in storage and I took off and I started another blog, Cancer Road Trip. And somewhere along the way, it occurred to me, if I could have a road trip to heal, why can't others? And that was the start of Cancer Road Trip. And so for this first trip that you've been planning, did you already select the people who are going on the trip or how did that happen? For the first trip, four of the seven have been selected, and they're being selected because they come from diverse backgrounds, diverse types of cancer. We have two caregivers included in the group, and all the people in the first group are willing to lend their social media networks to this, do TV interviews, et cetera. After this first group, we'll be accepting online video applications so anybody anywhere in the world can apply. And what are you looking for? Or who are you imagining that this trip is for? We're looking at doing them in a variety of ways. It might be for a type of cancer, brain cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer. It might be uh, based on an idea like Ayurvedic medicine. It might be based on meditation. It could be healing waters of Eastern Europe. There are a lot of different ways we can segment the idea of travel, health, and healing to create just an ongoing series of interesting film. And so you have the trip itself, the retreat itself, and then you have the film, the video that's going along with it. What are some of the other social media or media tangible things that you are creating as part of this whole package? Well, the film has several components to it. First, there's a documentary that comes out of it. The documentary is also repurposed for continuing education for medical professionals because they really, many medical professionals don't have a lot of information about the post-treatment aspect of the cancer experience. They're with you through treatment, but then after that, you're on your own. And people go through years and even decades of trying to get their lives back together. So through the power of story, we want to share those experiences and start to educate the broad-based medical community. Then from the film, we also are looking at streaming it in three segments by traveler, as we call the people who go on these trips, by location, and by food and culture. So you can binge watch in little snippets different elements of all these three categories. And we do that because everyone has short attention spans, but we want it to be fun, we want it to be interesting, and we want it to be inspiring. Yeah, that resonates with me so much what you said about the post-treatment care and just sort of lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And I know you know a little bit about my story. My listeners know a little bit about my story. And my diagnosis was fairly, I don't want to say, I hate kind of comparing like how intense or how traumatic somebody's diagnosis is. Mm -hmm. But my treatment was surgery And that was it. There was no systemic treatment or anything like that. I didn't have to do radiation. I didn't have to do chemo or anything. And yet still, once my follow-ups were done with my plastic surgeon, it sort of was like I didn't feel recovered. Yeah. I still had a lot of questions. I had limited mobility in my shoulder all of a sudden, which when I had spoken to the surgeons and the doctors about that, they said, oh, hmm, that's strange. That shouldn't have happened. (laughs) you're like, okay, awesome. You know, I even had one of my surgeons said, are you sure you had more mobility in your shoulder before the surgery? And I'm like, are you kidding me? I teach yoga. I think I know how much mobility I do or don't have in my (laughs) shoulder. Unbelievable, isn't it? Really unbelievable. And then, you know, that's physical, but then also just the emotional aftercare. And you're left with a lot of feelings and a lot of imbalances and questions and things that just sort of aren't taken care of. So that definitely resonates with me. The post-treatment phase of the cancer experience is something that we don't do a very good job of in this society. We're very good at interventional medicine. We diagnose and we treat, but we don't heal. Yeah. And you've done so much traveling. How many different countries do you think you've been to or how many different destinations? (laughs) Oh, I have no idea. Um, I'm just going to shoot from the hip and say maybe 40 or so. I I really don't know. Yeah. And I get the sense that you're very interested in cultures, like the culture of each place that you visit. Have you seen a difference in the way that people are cared for in other cultures or anything that you've seen that's different than what we're used to experiencing here in, in the West? 
You know, I have some anecdotal stories about that. Somebody told me in Japan that when you go into the hospital, you're given a beautiful, comfortable robe. And yeah. it's a much more personal and healing environment than, say, what we experience here in this country. I have friends that have been treated in France, and they their care, I think, is different than it is here. I haven't really focused to date on what medical care is like. I'm really focused on what does it take to heal? How can changing our paradigm through travel help us change our paradigm for life as well? I think one of the magical things about travel is you're in this cocoon of possibility. Anything can happen. And anything can happen because you're open to it. You're in a different environment. You're in a different routine. You have different stimuli around you. So all of a sudden, you're very present moment aware. And that's something that we really lose in our day-to-day -day lives. And I think by being very present moment aware and perhaps having a little bit of a sense of adventure because you're on a trip, you could be open to things that you might not ordinarily be open to. And you can be open to the emotional impact of an experience that can have real meaning for you. So now in our current present situation reality with the pandemic, and I will let you in on a little secret, which is that I have been binge watching old episodes of House Hunters International. <laughs> because... <laughs> Because you're seeing all these different countries and these beautiful locations and the biggest stressor, right, for the people on this show are, will all of my American shoes fit into this tiny European closet <laughs> or you know, whatever it is. But there's this fear in me, honestly, that we will not be able to go back to travel the way that it was it's just, it feels very messy. And so you're talking about this beautiful way that travel leaves us open that anything can happen because we're open to it. And we're kind of in that state of readiness to explore and then talking about how can we apply that in our daily lives? How can we apply that kind of feeling now feeling is that a lot of us feel very stuck and confined? Yeah, no, no, it's a very interesting question. I am somebody who is very strategic and big picture. Yeah. So for me, this is very confining. So one of the things that I did is I ordered a macro lens for my camera. And a macro lens allows you to see little bugs and things like that in a big picture and flowers and, you know, just anything you can think of. And it occurred to me that rather than going outside to a big world, I can make my little world bigger. Interesting. What are some of the other changes that you have noticed since the news of everything that was happening kind of came out? And I actually don't know what the state of New Mexico, like whether you guys are under a shelter in place or what the official word is in New Mexico. But what are some of the other things that have shifted quite abruptly for you? And how are you responding to those changes? Well, things have shifted enormously. One is the time frame. The time frame has been extended. As a result, I won't be traveling and I won't be able to continue to produce content, which has grown my audience to, I think last month we reached 600,000 or so on Twitter. And we've done better than that. But the point is, I have a growing audience. I don't even know what the numbers are, around 16,000 on Instagram, 70 on Twitter. We have almost 50,000 on Facebook. And now I don't have content for my audience. So one of the things I'm doing is starting a podcast. I think we're going to call it Bump in the Road. And <laughs> <laughs> it is about life's bumps in the road and how people manage them and how they use them really as a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. And so that is the content that's sort of going to be able to bridge the gap between the content, the travel-based content that you've been creating and what is available to you now. Absolutely. And it'll, it'll allow me to keep everything growing, to keep in touch with people. I love interviewing people. So I think it'll be a ton of fun. I have some, you know, tech hurdles to get over, but I'll yeah. get there. But I, I think when all the dust settles, we are going to be in a very different world. I think the travel industry is going to go through massive dislocation and shrink. And I don't know what that means for pricing. Is it going to be more expensive to travel, perhaps? I think just emotionally, we're going to be in a different place. It's very hard. You walk down the street now and everybody waves or they say hi, but everybody stays way apart. It's a very strange dynamic. People want to connect, but they don't dare, not physically at least, or not even in physical proximity. And that mindset's going to have lingering repercussions for us, I think, in ways that we can't begin to imagine. 
And I think economically, we've been living in a, a series of bubbles, no matter what the Fed does, in my opinion, which is worth what you're paying for. In my opinion, I, I, I just don't think they're going to be able to sustain it. And I think we're in for several years of some economic hard times. And I think that's going to influence things enormously, too. So I hope I'm absolutely wrong about that. But I think that we are going to go through a period of adjustment or readjustment, no matter what. And it's going to require both industry and people's expectations and perceptions to change. Mm -hmm. Talking about the economic impact, how is it that you feel confident that you will still be able to move forward with the cancer road trip retreats? And how does this situation shift the way that you're thinking about the business model or the way that it gets funded? Because what you're planning does not sound inexpensive to me. <laughs> oh, no, it's not inexpensive. And we have a pretty unique business model. I think there's an article in Forbes magazine coming out about us shortly. We're really a social entrepreneurship company. We have a social purpose, but we're a business. So we have some pretty flexible ways we can fund this. I think the biggest question is, how can we execute this with everything that's happened? And the bottom line answer is, I don't know right now. We have to wait for some things to just evolve a bit, but it may mean we limit it to the U.S. It may mean travels a little bit more continental which would not be the end of the world, but I would really like to be able to have these travels have a world perspective. So I don't know what's going to happen. I Right now, I don't have the information and I just have to let things evolve. Yeah. I think what I'm hearing from you in terms of ways that you are thinking about content differently or ways that you're thinking about the business model differently or even expanding your world through your macro lens of your <laughs> camera, it sounds like you have this fundamental characteristic, or maybe it's a learned trait, I don't know, of really being flexible and having a plan, but knowing when that needs to shift and being open to not knowing. Oh, I think that's very true. I think it's just a characteristic I have. It's like, <laughs> I like to, I cook, it's genetic. It comes from my, my grandmother. I, I think I'm just flexible and the glass is always half full. It's the way you have to be. Yeah. And going back to, I was thinking about what you were talking about with mindset and this way that we are social creatures and we're being forced to distance ourselves physically from other people. And that was very visceral to me. I went to the grocery store today for the first time in about, I think it's been a solid two weeks or two and a half weeks since the last time I went to the grocery store. And the store I typically shop in is Trader Joe's. And the last time I went, they did not really have all the measures in place that they have right now. Like they are only allowing 25 people in the store at once. And then you have to wait in line outside of the store until someone leaves. They have someone at the front sanitizing each and every shopping cart before they hand it to you. They have line markings by the checkout of where you can stand. There's no cash transactions happening. It's just very counterintuitive and kind of weird. And you find yourself in an aisle with another person and they kind of want to go by you, but they don't want to go by you. And everyone's kind of doing this weird little dance to try to keep a bubble. It just, ugh, it feels very bad. I'm wondering if you have any perspective or any advice for people on how to manage their mental state, how to manage sort of that social emotional need for connection right now. I think technology is a huge help there. Yeah. And personally, I revamped my schedule. Even though I'm very flexible, I still like to have something of a schedule because I think it keeps me productive. So I've always gotten up at 5.30 in the morning. And the first thing I do every morning, even pre-corona, is I find five things to be grateful for and I meditate for half an hour. So that has not changed. But what has changed is in the rest of my day, I'm now taking breaks to make sure I exercise. I've put in a second meditation time in the afternoon and I'm doing a yoga class every day. I'm trying to do it every day. I'm working on that still, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, on YouTube. So for me, I think the combination of technology to connect and then setting a personal schedule that's very health oriented has helped, but it's hard. I love Santa Fe. I have great friends here. I love being out and about. I've about had it. 
Hmm. So we talked about future implications for the travel industry. Are there any other future predictions that you have or things that you think are going to be drastically different in the world of entrepreneurship or even like personal care or anything like that? What do you see? Or for your own personal future, what might be different? Oh, interesting question. For me, I don't know what the path is, but I will find it. When I look across business and entrepreneurship, this may cause a bit of a shift in our values. Rather than being amused by the latest toy or gadget or bauble or whatever, maybe we'll start to get a little bit more real. And that may happen through this experience, and it may also happen with some economic limitation, if that's what evolves. And that could mean a very different landscape. I hope that some of the investors out there and the VCs and people like that start looking at some of these social entrepreneurship companies more seriously. We've had a, a period of these unicorns coming out of Silicon Valley that never mm -hmm. make money, have no plans to make money, and have outrageous valuations. Um, <laughs> what happened to a real business model where you actually plan to make money? Perhaps that will at least reset. It'll probably go back to ridiculous extremes at some point, but maybe it'll give it an opportunity to reset. That would be really nice. Hmm. And is there any advice that you have for someone out there who is trying to do something entrepreneurial and maybe like their entire vision for what they were going to do has just been completely blown out of the water right now? What is your best advice for somebody who's in that situation? Deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be hard. I think a lot of people are going to have to stop and pivot in a totally different direction. And it comes down to how long can you last? I'm looking at my business and I'm looking at actually hiring some people as independent contractors on a commission basis to help me implement some social media projects that I've been wanting to do for a while. So I think that there will be new opportunities, but I think a lot of old jobs are going to disappear. And I think if you can find a way to see those new opportunities and be part of that creative wave, then there are opportunities. But starting something creative or different is not easy. One, other people have to be able to see your vision. They don't always. You have to be able to sell it. You have to have it make economic sense. You have to put all the people and pieces together. It is not a slam dunk. Mm hmm what are some of the best ways for people to follow along with what you are creating in this time <laughs> to stay connected to Cancer Road Trip and to find out when the new podcast is available? Well, come on over first to social media. We're at Cancer Road Trip on Twitter and Instagram. We're using the Anti-Cancer Club page on Facebook since we have such a large following there. But come on over to the website, cancerroadtrip.com, and just sign up. We don't spam anybody. We don't share information. You just get an email when there's a new post. And do a little vicarious travel with us. Go to the photo galleries. I just got back from a trip to Africa, and I'm still putting up more photo galleries from Africa. I'm going to go back and revisit some other places and do some new photo galleries. So I hope it's a chance to vicariously travel a little bit for all of us right now. Do you know what the first place you want to travel is when you're able? You know, three places high on my list are millions. <laughs> I really want to go back to Ireland to do some light hiking and photograph the Wild Atlantic Way. And I'm part Irish. So there might be a little bit of a genealogy quest there. Okay. I love Italy. I just love Italy. And I'd like to go to Italy when everything settles down. And I'd like to go, one of my fantasies, which is manageable, would be to hole up on a Greek island for a while and run my oh. business from there. And that's on my list as well. Very nice. Very nice. Pat, is there anything else that you want to share with listeners of The Creative Imposter? Anything that you didn't get a chance to talk about or to say that is, is on your mind or on your heart right now? Hang in there, everybody. We will get through this. It will pass. And then we will have a new world, some new paradigms, and some new opportunities. Thank you so much to Pat Wetzel of Cancer Road Trip and the brand new Bump in the Road podcast, which is out now. And I imagine you can find it wherever you're listening to The Creative Imposter. And oh, hey, in a few weeks, I am going to be interviewing with Pat for her show. So if you want to hear about my bump in the road, subscribe to the podcast so you'll know when it's live. And also, I'll probably tell you. You know, one thing you may have noticed over the last few months during the pandemic is that a lot of the guests that I have had on The Creative Imposter, not all, but a lot, are also 
podcasters. And while that's not exactly by accident, podcasting is growing so much right now. And pretty much anyone who has a creative business, who wants to grow their community and expand their reach and change the status quo within their niche is turning to podcasting as a solution, as a platform, as a mode of creative self-expression that shifts culture and builds community. If this is interesting to you, or if you've been thinking about a podcast for a while, maybe it's time to get a little outside perspective on that idea from a trusted pair of ears. That's me. (laughs) I'm offering Launch Your Podcast, my popular class that's normally in person in Chicago, online via Zoom as an interactive opportunity to learn all about launching your show. July 9th. Tickets are $50, but if you act fast, by July 2nd, you can grab one of my free spots, only available through July 2nd, so don't wait, and we can dish a little bit about your show idea or help you come up with one. And then on July 14th, the first ever Podcast Envy office hours with your podcast boss, that's right, that's me, will be a mastermind discussion on how to define success for your show. This is one of the biggest mistakes that I see new podcasters making is not having a clear plan of how exactly they will know when their show is working for them and getting caught up in like numbers and metrics and downloads and sponsors. There are better ways to go about this and I want to help. This is an opportunity to dive deep into helping your show get you exactly where you want to be. Launch Your Podcast July 9th is just for newbies and office hours on July 14th is for you wherever you are on your podcasting journey from just thinking about it to trying to figure out what's next for your show. Details for both Launch Your Podcast and Office Hours are in the show notes for this episode, along with links to find Pat, Cancer Road Trip, and Bump in the Road podcast. That's at thecreativeimposter.com forward slash 109. Talking with Pat makes me yearn for travel, and there is a part of me that fears that we will never be able to do it again. So I'm thinking about doing a series here on The Creative Imposter all about travel to help us dream, to help us vision, to help us leave the confines of our home from our armchair. Does anyone sit in an armchair anymore? If you have a travel story of a moment when you were somewhere other than home where you had a major life-changing experience or realization or a clue, a shining light of inspiration as to your own creative life and work and identity, I would love to hear it. Message me. You can email me, andrea at thecreativeimposter.com. Again, that's andrea at thecreativeimposter.com. Send me an email and briefly let me know the gist of your travel story, and we'll set up a time to connect and chat and perhaps feature you right here on The Creative Imposter. This episode was mixed by Edwin Ruiz. Our theme music is by Jovia Armstrong. I thank you so much for listening. And right now, I know we're all sick of this whole thing. So where can you be flexible? What can you do to widen and open your world from wherever you are right now?